know, Rumble told uh, France, the government, to basically go fornicate themselves with wire brush when they said you have to take this content down. Rumble, yeah, people will be concerned they're, they're a publicly traded company. Here's the thing. Rumble is only as valuable as uh, their, their, their protection of free speech. In other words, if Rumble does not continue to adhere to the principles of protecting free speech, mm. why would anyone go to Rumble? So it's this self-protection mechanism where the company is only valuable if they actually do what they say they're going to do. And that's something that's exciting to me because it doesn't allow for doublespeak. Yeah, that's a good observation. You know, Rumble told uh, France. The I'm going to, I don't want to make it about me. And there's no but. But, <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, that is something that Robert Barnes and I have been saying since Rumble went public or made the announcement that they were going to go public through the reverse merger, whatever the system was. Um, back in the day, People were saying, Viva, how can Rumble remain independent? How can it remain uh, um, a loyal adherent to free speech if they go public? They get bought out by a certain amount of shareholders. Shareholder interest goes from being the proponent of free speech to being woke. And then lo and behold, Rumble goes the way of the YouTube, which, you know, is what it is, a massive, you know, massive corporation with the lion's share of the market, but that suppresses independent voices for ideological, politically motivated reasonings. What Robert and I said back in the day is that these warranties and representations are kind of baked into the product of the shares of Rumble. That's how they sold themselves to shareholders. It's not so easy to just say all of a sudden, well, now we're going woke without you know, potentially running into problems. Uh, problems being the value of the company, among other things. Uh, the second issue was that I, I, I don't exactly know what the corporate structure is, but I don't believe that voting um, can be so easily transferred, if at all, and will remain uh, bestowed to Chris Pavlovsky, who, so long as he remains alive, healthy, and loyal to his message, you know, if he doesn't get corrupted somewhere along the line, if he doesn't, uh, you know, whatever, get out of the company for whatever the reason, the risk is always there because there are no certainties in life except for life is change and life is uncertainty but um it's you know there's reasonable assurances in if you have to bet on something and if you have to bet on your future as a content creator and you have to bet on joining a platform that's going to respect free speech rumble is the only alternative i mean you could try to build your own internet um but rumble is not just the only alternative but it's becoming an ever increasingly viable alternative, successful, viable alternative. And by the way, in case anybody hadn't heard the big news, let me just wrap my headphone around there. Um, in case anybody hadn't heard the big news, uh, Steven Crowder just signed with Rumble or they announced it. I tweeted it out yesterday. Let me see. Maybe I can find the tweet of um, Steven Crowder sitting with Chris signing his contract. And making some jokes. Let me see where this was. Where? I know that I saw it. I, I tweeted the video out. And I'm losing my mind. Anyways, so Crowder has signed with Rumble. I know nothing of the deal. Here it is. I got it. I know nothing of the deal. None of my business. Um, but it's big news. Here, let's, let's, let's play this for everybody who hasn't seen it. While we await... The man of the hour, in fact, I, I forewarned him, it'll be the man of the hour and a half, Chris Sky. Let me see if he's texting me here. Okay, beautiful. Uh, let's just play this real quick, Lack. Real quick, Lack. Uh, <laughs> oh, Chris is in the backdrop. Chris, one second. I'm gonna, while people trickle in, let's just, let's just play this real quick video so everybody knows the big news. But what we do, you guys know, you know, betting on ourselves and Rumble is a hedge on those bets because they actually uh, support. But what we do, you guys know, you guys know what we do, right? Absolutely. You know, it comes with like, there are going to be some headaches. <laughs> <laughs> Not everyone's going to be thrilled with this. Like, you know, YouTube. Chris has seen his better, his no, fair Rumble's share of headaches. No, Rumble. No, it's Rumble. It's Rumble. Okay. We've got Chris Sky in the backdrop. For those of you who don't know who Chris Sky is, um, I don't think anybody in the chat doesn't know who Chris Guy is. So I'm not even, I'll, I'll bring Chris in. He's going to give the 30,000 foot overview. Uh, I asked for 90 minutes of his time. I, I said, long format. We're going from childhood to present day, running for the mayor and everything in between. So he's ready. He looks stoked. I'm bringing it, Chris, I'm bringing you in in three, two, 
one. Sir, let me let me zoom in like this. Okay, how are you doing? I'm doing awesome, brother. How about you? Very good, very good. So th- we've we've never met in person. I think we may have been incidentally at the same rallies at some point at the same time, but I, I've, I've never met you in person. Uh, but look, any, anybody who's been involved in the COVID hysteria over the last three years knows who you are and either loves you or hates you or anywhere in between on that spectrum. Chris, for those who don't know, 30,000 foot overview, who are you? Well, you said you want to start from childhood or you want to start from COVID? Well, let's, no, no, we're going to, 30,000 foot overview, who you are now, but then we're going right back to childhood. I, I know a bit of your childhood. I've been watching interviews all morning, but oh, awesome. 30,000, go for it, 30,000 foot overview. Uh, I would consider myself an advocate for human rights, an advocate for freedom, and somebody who's spreading the message of just say no and united non-compliance, uh, not just here, but all around the world. I've been speaking all around the world. I've been taking action all around the world. And we need people to realize that this is a global problem and it's going to be a problem that the people are going to have to solve themselves. They're not going to be able to really look for federal politicians to to save them like they've been trying to do. And we're going to get into the non-compliance strategy philosophy in a bit. Um, You're 30, you're 36 years old now? 39. 30, 39. Looking good, man. And um, born and raised where? I was born in North York. Ontario, that's a suburb of Toronto. Uh, I was born uh, basically at Jane and Finch, which people of the area now know is not a very nice area, kind of a rough area. But uh, then I grew up in Woodbridge, Vaughan area. I've moved around all different municipalities since then. I went to, uh, I graduated high school at Woodbridge College. I graduated uh, with honors, obviously. Uh, I graduated with just under an A-plus average. I also graduated with the maximum amount of allowable absences because I was the last uh, year where we had grade 13. So we were actually 18 years old in high school. So we could legally just sign ourselves out and leave whenever we wanted. So I looked at the rule book and I saw how many days I legally had to be in school to graduate. So I made sure I was there just the exact number of days I had to be. And I still, I still did very well. I got scholarships uh, to various universities. I went to York University because it was actually close to where my office was because I was working at the family business while I was actually going to school at the same time for medicine. And then the family business got a chance to expand when I was around 19 uh, from a building corporation into a develop, design, and build corporation. And when I saw the... Uh, I saw, let's just say, the potential versus the uh, versus the career path I was taking in school and the trajectory on which that career path would be taking me. And I decided to leave school where I was doing very well, but I didn't really like it. And I just went into the corporate world. So I've been in the planning, develop and design and build world since I was around. I've been in the building world since I was like a child, but I've been in the development world since I was 19 years old. So I've been dealing with the government virtually my entire adult life. So I'm in this very unique spectrum where I'm in both sides of the fence. Like I was in the private sector, but I had to deal with the government virtually on a daily basis. Now, the, the, the thing that makes it special is the government doesn't really have budgetary or time constraints, as we all know. If something they tell you it's going to cost a million bucks, they'll end up spending 10 million. If they tell you it's going to take a month, it'll take a year. We don't have that luxury in the private sector. So I had to work in, in within their bureaucracy, cut through their red tape and work within the budgetary and time constraints of the private sector. So I developed a very unique skill set, we'll say, and not just in, with communication of people of all, all all walks of life, but of getting things done quickly and efficiently and, and understanding the implications, especially of political decisions with regards to development. And that's what we're seeing right now with this whole Agenda 2030. That's literally what I was doing my entire life, is looking at blueprints, looking at policies, and seeing how it's going to affect how people are going to be living their lives now and in the future. So when I see this stuff coming down the pipe, for me, it's like when people are looking in the matrix and they see that code, I just see exactly what they're trying to do. And I can, I can, and that's why I can explain to people in such an articulate and simplified way, because they want you to believe everything's so complicated, you can't understand it, so you should just sit back, don't pay attention, and let them make all their decisions for you. But we all know what happens when somebody else is making decisions for you. Number one, you're not going to get the result you want for yourself. And number two, you're not going to get the, the optimal result because nobody wants better for you than you. So if you're not paying attention and you're allowing the government to make all these decisions for your life, 
or you're simply complying with the government whenever they tell you to do something, you're going to end up worse off virtually every single time. And that's basically the main message that I've been trying to convey to people all over the world since I started speaking out since the start of COVID, that when it regards to COVID, everything they told you was about health and safety, had nothing to do with health and safety. It was all about power and control. And everybody that wa still wants to doubt that, a lot of people woke up to that reality, but a lot of people still doubt that reality. Well, if you doubt that reality, number one, we already have so many studies that have come out now that said masks did basically absolutely nothing. And, and we all knew that. Let me, let me stop you there. New York Times opinion piece, virtually, I'll, I'll pull it up while, you're, while you continue talking, literally said, masks did nothing. Did we learn anything? Uh, uh, just to add it to the list of things that the experts and the authorities got wrong from the beginning. Yeah. Exactly. So we know the mask did nothing to help you. They definitely didn't make you healthier or safer. But what did they do? They showed that you're compliant. They showed that you're scared. They perpetuated the idea that everybody else should be scared. And it led to all the other restrictions. So there you go. That's that's exactly what you don't want. Then what did we find out about the jab? At first, they were almost 100 percent effective. By the time everybody started dying suddenly, they basically told you that natural immunity is far more effective than any of the jabs you could take. They also let you know that the more jabs you took, the less healthy you're going to be. But crazy conspiracy theorists like us that warned you that the jabs weren't going to work and warned you that they were going to try to make you take more and more and then try to use them as an ex a way to exclude you from society were obviously all wrong. But no, we weren't. So once well, you see the... Oh, sorry, getting, go ahead. No, I'm saying we're getting way ahead of it. because, And not that I want to avoid talking about this. We're going to talk about this. This is just... I haven't gotten through your childhood yet, Chris. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I'm going to leave that in the backdrop so that we can, we can get to it. Uh, YouTube, that's uh, New York Times and uh, what's the one I have up here? NBC News. Okay, Chris, two, a few things you said. Uh, you moved around a lot as a kid. Uh, first of all, your, la your, your, your real last name is Sacaccia? Sacocha. Sacocha. It, uh, it means pocket in Italian. Okay. And now, uh, Pocket? Pocket, like, yeah. Oh, sacoche, like pocket. a sacoche. Um, why did you move around so much as a kid? Were, you, were your, your parents together, divorced? Uh, were you moving? Like, oh, no, no, no. My, my parents were together since they were 13 years old. I'm the youngest of three siblings. I'm, I have two older sisters. I'm the only son, and I'm the youngest. Uh, I was born in North York. We moved to Woodbridge when I was a, just a couple years old, and that's when my parents had built a house there. And I lived in Woodbridge until I moved out of my parents' house when I was 21. From there, I just I moved around because I was doing different developments in different in different areas of Ontario. So I would buy a house for myself, live there, and then sell it and buy another house for myself somewhere else. It was more of a, I was moving around more for business purposes than anything else. And I presume the laws are the same in Ontario in terms of primary residents being tax exempt. So you can, you can flip residences and actually make a decent uh, income doing that. Yes, of course. That's what lots of people do. Even foreigners do that here, to try to do that here. But uh, yeah, no, you can definitely do that as a Canadian resident. And that's a, and that's what I was, I was encouraging lots of people to do that, especially during the booms, because as someone who was developing and building, I can tell you right now, uh, about 15 years ago, we were building townhouses in, in Woodbridge, Western and Rutherford area, and they were around 2,000 square feet going for 330 grand. And then 15 years after that, we acquired the land literally right next door to what I built 15 years prior. And the townhouses that looked a little different, but about the same size, equivalent value, were going for over a million dollars by that. So it, it's safe to say that in, real estate was a great investment. But it's also safe to say that uh, the cost of real estate and the cost of living in general is really outpacing uh, people's cost of wages. And that's what this whole Agenda 2030 is all about. It's all about the fact that they know they can't keep up with people's cost of living. And so they're trying to get everybody used to having a lower standard of living, much lower, to the point where they believe they can sustain it for as long as possible. And you already saw uh, massive riots in France. Did you see those riots today? Oh, yeah. What were they uh, rioting about? I, I didn't see the ones from today. What, what, what's the most current riots about? Because they're raising the pension age. Why are they raising the pension age? Because they, they know that the pensions are already broke and they can't pay people. So they want to make it so you're instead of 65 getting it, so you're 70. That way, a whole bunch of you are probably going to die before you can even get the money. And then okay. when you do get the money, it's worth even less anyway. And the argument was once upon a time, well, average lifespan has gone up now. So the pension has to go up because people are working longer. Except I think over the last three years, lifespan has gone down. And I suspect the same in France as in America. Uh, okay, before we get into the substance yet, okay, so you're youngest of three, parents in the development world, that's what your family business was? 
Um, if people are looking at you now, they're going to see a, a, a big burly guy with lots of tattoos. But as a child, were you a troublemaker? Were you, you were you bouncing around high schools? Were you? Um, I love the fact you say, yeah, I graduated with honors and an A plus. Like I barely made it through high school. I was like D D whatever is above sixty. Lucky to get through, and then I found my way in Sejep in university. But as a child, were you a troublemaker, defiant? What is it called? Oppositional defiance disorder, getting into trouble. No. Or were you like a you know a good a good boy so to speak in quotes? When I was in grade uh, three, four, and five, I went to a private school where my sisters actually went. And in grade three, I was so well advanced that they actually wanted me to skip two full grades, not just one. And I didn't want to do it because I didn't want to be two years younger than everybody else in my class. So I just said no. So then when I got to grade four, uh, I basically had to sit out in the hallway because I'd finish all the work real fast and then I had nothing to do. So I just start talking to people that still had work to do. So it ended up being an awkward situation for me. I ended up staying there until grade five and then I left because ra- I didn't really like the private school. I didn't like the idea of being around these wealthy kids, uh, the status. It, I would get into I would get into arguments a lot because we had different ideologies, I guess you could say. I was more... I was more uh, from a, a working class family background and these people were of like social status. So I didn't really get along that well with them. And we went, uh, even though I had great, I had great friends, don't get me wrong. Uh, but then I ended up going to a, a different school in grade six called Pine Grove. And we went there because uh, my family wanted me to go to a school called Woodbridge College. It's not anything special, but it was seen as one of the better schools in the area. The other options being schools like Father Brissani. And if people from my area know, <laughs> no, it was probably a better option where I went. Hold I ended up going to Woodbridge College from grade seven all the way up to grade 13. You look like you know something that I don't know about that Father's College. Does it have a, a bad reputation? That It does. It does. It has a bad reputation for uh, churning out, let's just say, underachievers. All righty. Um, okay. Interesting. So, so, uh, and no, no trouble with, uh, well, trouble with authorities, trouble with the law as a kid, you succeeding. in Well, when I was in high school, they already started calling me defiant because (laughs) teachers would give me orders of things that I thought were ridiculous. I would just say no, like I do right now. I tell everybody just say no. When someone tells you to do something, you know, it's not in your best interest. It doesn't matter if they're supposedly an authority figure. Like I was 15, 16 years old. If some uh, adult came and told me to do something that I know was wrong, I'm not going to do it just because you're an adult or you're a teacher. I'm going to I'm going to do it if I think it's right. So I was already known as defiant. I was the kind of guy that would stand up for the bullies in the schoolyard. I wouldn't go looking for trouble, but at the same time if I saw somebody picking on someone, I couldn't just stand there and watch. I'd go and ask the bully to pick on me instead. And 99 times out of 100 as you find, uh, the bullies will just walk away. And the one time out of 100 where they don't they would have wished they had. And so that's that's pretty much how I've been since a child. And I kicked that into I took that into adulthood. I guess that's why I started speaking out because well, I spoke out. I didn't want to speak out, to be honest. I didn't want to speak out because I didn't want the negative attention that as you can see I got. I got 25 arrests in 27 and a half months. Yeah. Uh, I got them attacking me, calling me everything from a attempted cop killer to a racist to a white supremacist, uh, someone who beats their wife attempted drug dealer, gang, but I've been called everything you could possibly be called in the media. Let's just say that. So I knew what I was going to get if I spoke out. I didn't want that. I didn't really want to speak out, but at the same time, I wanted to help people. Uh, and then my wife was the one that made me speak out. She said, you know what you're talking about. You are a leader. And she said, if you don't help people and you don't warn people, everything that happens is going to be your fault. So she basically put the whole weight of the world on my shoulders as only a good woman can do. And that's what made me actually start speaking out because otherwise I probably wouldn't have because my business, my business was heavily affected. So was everybody else's. But at the same time, I, I like, like everybody else, I thought speaking out would just make my own individual situation worse. And it, of course it did in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways it made it better. All right. Now this is going to be the last question before I wind up on YouTube to go exclusive on rumble and on locals where we're streaming. Um, Whatever anybody says about you and whether or not you, you know, your, your predictions, I went back to review a lot of your predictions, a, a lot. You've been more right than CNN, MSNBC, New York Times. Some, there have been some of the odd ones that have might have, you know, not come exactly to fruition, but such are predictions. Um, you, you seem very knowledgeable, and I'm not saying that to flatter you. You, you seem very knowledgeable. What, what, even prior to COVID, what was your source? What was your passion for education, information? Where did you get it? How did you digest it? And um, and what's your what's your method? 
I would, I have just, I go by the quote, the day you stop learning is the day you stop living. So I've just always had a thirst for knowledge. I would get it from individuals. I would get it from the internet. I would get it from traveling around the world. I've been to over 40 countries. I've done actual, like, for instance, I went and spent two weeks uh, going to Germany just to study the Holocaust when I was around 19 or 20 years old because I had such an interest in World War II. So I, I try to gain real world knowledge uh, through a uh, real world experience as well as just a lot of research. And I've been researching since I was about 14, 15 years old. Alex Jones, was, I was actually a fan of Alex Jones since I was about 15 years old. And I and uh, for him to have me on the show and for him to even refer to me as the world's leading activist like 25 years later is kind of surreal. It's pretty amazing. And it feels good because I know I'm having a, I, I actually affect individual people's lives and I affect them in a positive way. And I affect them in a positive way that lasts. Like I get people calling me, stopping me, texting me every single day, dozens of times a day every single day it never fails and they'll all say something very similar you helped me not wear a mask or you i didn't get a, a vaccine because of you or i went and visited my grandmother in the hospital when i was too scared to before all these things oh they seem like little things but they're not they're fundamentally huge mental things and that's what people need to realize that the, the, the last couple of years has been a giant psychological warfare operation and it's been designed to disarm every one of your natural defenses. And it was also designed to literally reward those who are, would be unrewardable in other situations. Like in, for instance, it made compliance and cowardice become heroic and virtuous. Never in the history of humanity has compliance and cowardice and simply just doing what you're told been heroic and virtuous, except during COVID. Don't question, just do exactly what you're told. You're a hero now. Absolutely ludicrous, but it worked. It worked because a lot of people were looking for any excuse to comply because just like I said, I didn't want any of the detention, so I know exactly how everybody else felt. But it needed to be done and it still needs to be done because they haven't stopped. This entire COVID operation was literally to prime you for what they're doing now with the climate change agenda because they knew the average person wasn't going to say, oh, I'll give up my car and give up my house and give up my, my traveling around the world for the good of the climate. Nobody gave, nobody cared. No one thinks you're actually going to die if you don't stop eating meat in 30 years. Nobody believes that crap. So they can't, they can't, they can't get you to go along with it. They can't get you to volunteer. But with COVID, with COVID, oh my gosh. Now, if you didn't go along with it, you're killing grandma. You're killing babies. They're making you feel as guilty as possible. There was two fundamental things they wanted to do with COVID. The first one being to get rid of the notion that individual rights and freedoms are paramount to a successful society, which we know is reality because we've had world wars and millions of people fighting and dying to preserve individual rights and freedoms. That's how important they have been to society. But in COVID, within just a few weeks, individual rights and freedoms were not just no longer paramount to a successful society, they were selfish and dangerous. And those who would fight for rights and freedoms were not patriotic. They were not heroes. Now they were domestic terrorists. That was a huge, huge fundamental shift in human thought and human consciousness that they perpetrated on the entire world after generations and generations of believing one way within a few months, weeks, in fact, two weeks to flatten the curve. It took them that. That's all it took to reprogram billions and billions of people to now loathe rights and freedoms and attack those that were trying to protect their rights and freedoms. The second thing that they needed to do was to get rid of the notion of individual responsibility because individual responsibility leads to independence. Independence leads to freedom. So they need you to get used to the idea of collective responsibility. It's straight out of every communist playbook, straight out of every Marxist playbook. This way, now, the government and everybody else are partially responsible for every decision you make. So now the government's involved in every aspect of your life. Nobody would have agreed to this except with COVID. So now, two years later, we went from a society where individual rights and freedoms were paramount to a successful society uh, to now rights and freedoms are selfish and dangerous. And we went to the, and we went to the fact that, uh, sorry, so, sorry, sorry, I just hit my foot there. 
<laughs> no and we went to the fact that we need to get and we went to the fact that we have collective responsibility so now i need to wear my mask to protect you you need your very mask to protect grandma we're all in this together that whole garbage bullshit and what does that prime us for that primes us perfectly for the next phase the next phase of programming which is the climate change agenda because a pandemic can only last for so many years the climate change agenda can last for generations. And in order for you to accept and volunteer for climate change servitude, we needed to get rid of the notion of individual rights and freedoms, and we needed to install the notion of collective responsibility. So now the next phase is 15 minute cities, personal carbon allowances, and people write those words down, uh, digital IDs, digital currency, I use those as one, basically, because they're going to come out almost together. And then finally, um, you're gonna, they're going to connect this all with a universal basic income that people are going to require because they're going to use a combination of an increase in cost of living due to inflation, highly outpacing wages and supplemental income, combined with a whole new system of taxing you in the name of saving the planet. So now we're at phase three. Individual rights and freedoms are selfish and dangerous. And now you have to give them up, not for your health and safety and not just temporarily because of a pandemic. Now you have to give them up forever and for the good of so-called Mother Earth. See how collective, see how they tiptoe you to tyranny? It's always one step at a time. And so how do people think that this collectivism is, is really this dangerous? And why are 15-minute cities so dangerous? And how are they going to tie in the carbon and climate scam into this? Well, as you saw, everybody tells you, a 15-minute city means that everything you need is going to be a 15-minute walk or bike ride. Why don't they mention cars? Because the whole purpose of a 15-minute city is to eliminate cars. If you see any renderings of what a 15-minute city is supposed to look like, you'll notice there's two things, or there's not two things. You'll notice no single-family dwellings with garages anywhere, only mixed-use buildings where you have commercial at the bottom and residential on top because they want you to live and work in the same building so you don't even have to leave the building for most of your life, let alone leave the block or your 15-minute city district. <laughs> That's that's what they want. That's really bad. Yeah, I know. And so the sorry, go ahead. You were going to say oh, something. Well, no, you finish that thought because I got another question. The other thing you're not going to see in their renderings are cars anywhere. You're going to see people on bikes, scooters. You're going to see public transit. And there's a reason for this. If you look up 15 minute city in Google and define what it is, the very first thing that every single publication will admit is that the primary purpose of a 15 minute city is to reduce the individual's carbon footprint. Now, in North America, 99, whoever has a car, that is your number one thing that creates the most of your carbon footprint, your car. So in order to reduce the individual carbon footprint, the fastest, most efficient method is to reduce the number of people who own cars. So to do that, you're gonna do things like get rid of car lanes, introduce bike lanes, get rid of single family houses, introduce these, uh, bi uh, introduce these big buildings, they're also getting rid of parking lots. When they have new developments, instead of minimum amounts of parking, they have maximum amount of parking. All the lanes that do end up still allowing you to drive cars on them, they make them ultra low emissions roads. So you'll only be able to drive cars on them if you have an electric car. So eventually, the only people that are going to be driving are Ubers, government vehicles, ambulances, government themselves because they're essential and they're exempt or anybody who's rich enough to have one of these cars. So already they're going to eliminate vehicle traffic from about 75 to 80% of you by 2030. That's the goal. They want eight out of 10 people in the city to no longer have an automobile. And that means you're not going to be traveling very far because if you only have a bike, scooter or public transit to rely on, that's why they're creating these so-called 15 minute districts. They literally call them districts straight out of the Hunger Games. And if you want to know how they're going to keep you in your district, just look at Oxford, England. I was in England in September, one of the many countries I spoke in. I got to speak to people who live in Oxford as the, the literal model of the 15 minute city for the around the world was being implemented. In Oxford, England, they now have six 
separate districts. These districts are separated by physical barricades with actual bollards, and they also have traffic cameras that will scan your license plate and fine you if you try to drive through to the other district. You're only allowed to leave your district up to 100 days per year under this plan and only at certain times. And if you do, right now you get a fine. How long will it be till you get arrested or killed like in Hunger Games? Right now, they're also telling you if you want to leave when you're not allowed, you have to get special government permission to leave your district. So they're trying to tell you, oh, that's just Oxford, England, but that's not going to happen here. Meanwhile, they have now expanded that to all other parts of the UK. While they are rioting in the streets, while they voted, 94% of the public voted no against these measures, the government still is implementing them, you know, for your own good. And now they've already announced in Canada, 15-minute cities, Edmonton, Vancouver, Toronto, Ottawa, even smaller places like Kitchener, and even really smaller places like Guelph are all doing this. And there's no need to do it. They're doing it because they're being paid to do it. So they're getting all these federal dollars to implement these so-called measures, and they're putting that money in their pocket. So they're basically getting international money from the World Economic Forum paid to our crony politicians to push and implement these agendas against the will of the people, against the best interests of the people. So once you have your 15-minute city set up with the physical barricades, the cameras, and they have it set up so you can only go uh, out of your district at certain times of year, how else do you think they're going to keep you there? The next one's levels of tyranny are psychological and financial. So now we're going to have something, the most propaganda you're ever going to see. You want a prediction? Here's a prediction. A massive multi-billion dollar propaganda campaign over the next months to year that's going to push people to voluntarily track their carbon footprint. That is going to be the biggest thing you see. They already don't they already have an app for that, Chris? Hold on, before you even go on there, I just want to bring this up because this is um, I started with the the, the title. The 15-minute city freakout is a case of study, is a case study in conspiracy paranoia. Far-right protesters in the UK claim that Oxford's traffic control plan is part of a global authoritarian plot. What the heck is going on? Let me just, I just want to, uh, I just want to get down to this part here. At issue, I mean, this is after they've called, they've primed you to believe it's a conspiracy theory. At issue was the proposed introduction of six new traffic filters. I don't like that. Hold on here. Intended to limit car use through residential parts of the city at peak hours. Monitored by automatic license plate readers, these filters would find drivers from outside the county of Oxfordshire who entered central areas during high traffic periods. Oxford residents will be allowed fine free peak hour access for 100 days per year with residents of the wider county able to apply for a 25 day fine free access permit. It's a conspiracy theory but, uh, but uh, oh it's a God. conspiracy theory that's exactly <laughs> as I explained it, right down to the 100 days that you're allowed to leave at the certain times they say, and right down to you having to obtain special permission if you want to leave at another time. Um, okay, Chris, hold, okay, I want to move off YouTube, but I want to end with one thing because no, no one will say that I've conducted a serious interview if I don't deal with one issue. You sort of touched on it a few seconds ago, and no, I'm not going to belabor it. Uh, as um, others have done, but you're called lots of names. If I can pull up your Wikipedia page, I'll pull that up in a second because there's a hilarious one in there. So and, and wait, I want to just cut you off for one second. Yeah, on no. that Wikipedia page, mine is the only Wikipedia page in the world that cannot be edited. <laughs> well, okay, look, I, you guys can go through it because it's hilarious. The one I found funny. There's some that are not funny that, you know, you, you'll, you'll take flack for for the rest of your life. And some will say, and many will say rightly so. But this is the one I love. Following his arrest in Thunder Bay, Sakotia, I'm sorry, but uh, Sakotia and his associates demanded free food at a restaurant in Sault Ste. Marie. When the owner declined, the group began to leave negative online reviews at the business. Okay, I thought that was just, if that's going to make it onto somebody's Wikipedia page, true or false, and even if true, my goodness. But no, Chris. The one 100 percent false, by the way. I never, I, and I can explain. I can explain the exact thing that happened, if you like, because I really didn't like that story. Because <laughs> when we were traveling anywhere, what we would do is we would find restaurants that were freedom fighting restaurants 
that wanted to like not do vaccine passports, that wanted to remain open when they were told to close. And we would bring them business and we would make sure we paid them and gave them tips. We never asked for free food from anybody. I started a nonprofit called Back to Work where I literally took time out of my day to go and visit hundreds of people who own small businesses and taught them how to go around the restrictions, taught them about special clauses in their leases so they would be able to keep their businesses, keep their homes and keep feeding their children. So the idea that I would ask for free food from a restaurant is preposterous, number one. <laughs> and number two, that, that especially a restaurant that hated us. Why would we go or even contact a restaurant that's openly against us online? This woman made up the entire story so she could get a CBC article. But Chris, and the idea that somehow leaving bad reviews, I mean, that's a tactic that has been used for cancellation by other factions as a strategy that that would make it into a Wikipedia page. But that's an immaterial accusation. The one that you take flack for, and you'll take flack forever. And, and I, I, I question myself, I was like, how long does someone either have to uh, answer to, apologize for, or not apologize for something before it's baked into the cake, you deal with it, and you either decide if you write that person off for the rest of their lives as a human being or not. The, the Facebook post, the Holocaust denial Facebook post, and, and I'm not going to go into this for a half an hour, so don't worry about it. I want to talk about. I want to talk about it though, because there's no. I do not deny the Holocaust. Number one. Well, so, so I question look, look, the number of six million, and so I can look, explain look, why I question look, the number look, of six million. Hold on, hold on, because I watched your interview with Rebel News, and I, I look. I saw the argument. I'll just preface this by saying there are, in my view, like there's three types of Holocaust denial. One is it never happened. It was a big lie. Like like it never happened. The other one was it happened, but it was facilitated by. Uh, you know, a, a globalist elite, Zionist elites to justify the claim to Israel. Others are that it happened, but the number is exaggerated to further the claim for the, for the state of Israel. And then, you know, you have your spectrum in between. I don't believe that, and I know this might be very shocking and, and horrifying to say, I don't believe any of this discourse or affirmations should be illegal. I actually believe that, that the laws that prohibit people from having baseless, offensive, and maybe even, uh, you know, quasi-dangerous in an ideological sense, it doesn't actually remedy anything. It just exacerbates a problem by saying, why can't we talk about it? Which then further cements the idea or solidifies the idea in the minds of those. Your, 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 your Facebook post, how long, it's 10 years ago, right? Give or take. Yeah. Just, I'm not going to pull it up. It says uh, the number is exaggerated. It's part of a, a Jew history lie. Uh, what is the context of this? Like, I know back in the day, and I'm not trying to steel man your defense to this in as much as you might have or not have one. Back in the day, people regarded the internet as the source for edgy content. You'd go out there, you'd make offensive jokes, you'd say stupid things, and that was the humor. Nobody was looking at it in the way that they're looking at it now. That's why people get into a lot of trouble on Twitter for using the N-word 15 years ago when edgy shit was what was on Twitter and the interwebs. Um, I understand the rationale, which is that you question the official number. Uh, People will say, by questioning the official number, the intention, the motivation is to minimize it, to say that it's not as bad as it was. And I say to that generally, if it's 5 million, 6 million, or 7 million, and someone says, I don't think it was 6, but 5, well, I don't think anyone's minimizing genocide by saying it was, uh, it was 500,000 or a million less than what you say the estimate. Genocide is genocide. And saying 6 million Jews or 5 million Jews in the Holocaust is a worse genocide than a million and a half, two million Armenians during the first genocide. I mean, you're dividing by zero in terms of atrocity. But what was your rationale? What was your thought process when you made that post? Uh, and I guess the other question is, at the end of the day, do you regret it and do you wish you hadn't done it? Well, very simple. Because I, like I said, I actually went to Germany and spent two weeks studying the Holocaust, going to actual concentration camps, seeing the different areas where they kept POWs versus the Jewish people. And I saw the differences. So I know the Holocaust was a real thing. I also talked to about 12 different Jewish scholars. And these are Jewish guys that studied the Holocaust longer than I had been alive at the time. I was only like 20, 20 years old. So every single one of these guys, I asked the exact same question. How many people died in the Holocaust? And every single one of them gave me a different answer. And two of them gave me very specific answers that I'll never forget. One of those answers were, we don't know. And anybody who tells you they know is lying. And the other one was, we will never know. So at the, taking that into account, when people understand that the people that came up with the idea that 6 million died, the original estimate, and we have to use the word estimate because that's what it is because nobody knows, was 18 million. 
18 million was the first estimate for how many Jewish people died in the Holocaust. Until people pointed out that there weren't even 18 million Jewish people alive on planet Earth at that time. So then that same the same people that came up with 18 million just arbitrarily transformed that number into 6 million. Now, if you know anything about Jewish uh, religion, and I know just a little bit, there are various Jewish texts that state in a prophecy that after 6 million people are killed, they will get a new homeland, basically Israel. And if you look at publications, if you can even, you can even Google the, the, the term 6 million dead Jewish people, and you will see publications dating back to the early 1900s, pre-World War II, stating in more than one place and more than one time that 6 million Jewish people are in trouble or 6 million Jewish people are dying. And they reference that number 6 million because that was a prophetic number that signified that they were going to be getting a new homeland soon. So that is why I say they use that number of six, because for them, it's a meaningful number. But we also have to acknowledge that it's an estimate, and it's an estimate that comes from a much higher estimate that couldn't even have been probable. So people need to understand that, like you said, I don't think it didn't happen at all. But I don't, I don't believe that people shouldn't be allowed to discuss it. Because when they, it just like with the with COVID, when people say you're not allowed to discuss this, the science is settled. Whenever someone says something like that, it should raise red flags, black flags, every type of flag. Well, th this is the this is the argument, and I won't belabor it more than this: is that, and I I I, ag I agree that people should not be legally precluded from from discussing these things, and I also believe that there is on on the spectrum the sliding scale of like Holocaust denial, what is called Holocaust denial. Where they fact they include in that contradicting the number versus it never happened or it was all an orchestrated plot. And in which, by the way, I'm still interested in hearing what people have to think about this because I want to know what they think about this, and I don't want them being legally precluded from saying it. So I don't know who thinks it was, a, you know, it was a grand scheme uh, that a slaughter allowed to happen so that uh, uh, you know the Jews can claim um, the state of Israel. And by the way, I just brought up a chat that said, "Viva, do you know something about Jews?" Chris, I am. My grandfather came from Poland, so escaped in 36. It doesn't offend. It doesn't offend me to hear you say any of this. And reading, even reading the the post, I say, okay, look, it's it's provocateur, um, you know, content creation. Like was the you know the norm. It at was the time. meant to provide. It was meant to provoke engagement on the topic. Exactly what we're doing now. And now, but then the 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 steel man of the counter argument is that people will say by denying the number, you minimize the atrocity, and therefore try to ignore it or some might even say you know encourage another one. Oh, really in that in that sense okay so when stalin killed millions and millions of people more than that in russia does that make does that make it more or less important than the holocaust based on the number of people that died well that that is that is a debate that is actually used to explain a lot of resentment that people do have where hitler is the the, the greatest tyrant of all time when other tyrants have been responsible no, way for more but then people say, well, they weren't targeted. You know, it was just mass starvation of 50 million people, not targeted extermination of blacks, Jews, and gypsies. Um, and, but all I'd say, and I don't want this to turn into the entire discussion, yeah. you, you, will, you will be answering for that post for the rest of your life, probably. I, in my own mind, it's like, at what point does someone change as a human? And at what point do I say, even if they meant it in the most vitriolic, anti-Semitic way possible, at what point do we write off everything that that human has to contribute to society for the rest of their lives? Because that's certainly not how you remedy or heal any of the uh, discriminatory sentiments that might have been implied with that statement. But, um, and I don't know what that has to do with anything to do with COVID mandates or climate well, change or all these other things that they're trying to do to us. I'll tell you what it does. It allows Wikipedia to write you off as a human for the rest of your life because 10 years ago, you might've put out a stupid post. That's, that's what it is, which is why... I think we've addressed it. I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied in my soul. And now we can go to continue talking the current stuff without having written off someone who might have still something of value to contribute to the world as we know it. Chris, I'm going to end on YouTube and stay yep. on Rumble. It changes nothing from our end. Everybody out there, um, go do it. Let me, let me just put the link in there one more time because sweet, we're not, we're not yet done with the, the conspiracy theory of Oxford City. Um, and then, and then more, and then getting into you running for mayor in Toronto, where you will expect some of your historical tweets and posts and whatever to come up again. Everyone? Oh, of course. <laughs> All right, we're going over to Rumble and locals in three, two, one. Now, Ugh, damn it, now. Okay, Chris. Um, uh, well, I should have just one. Do, do you do you how do you, 
do you regret it or do you say, I, I can't change it. It's made me who I am today. I don't live with regrets. And I stand by exactly what I said. If I ever said something that I thought I should apologize for, I would apologize for it when I said it. And it would be usually to somebody personally. Because if I make blanket statements about something, it's usually because I've done my research and I'm basing it on a fact. Not on, and it, it offends people. Well, guess what? The truth is offensive. The truth is that that's what happens. And the, and the more, and that now I'm hated even more in society because we're basically living in a world of universal deceit. Everything people believe is a lie. So well, when that, someone that, goes and tells them the truth that they don't, they don't like, they, they get upset. Well, that, that, and when you live in a world of universal deceit, you begin to question even the most basic things that you were taught, such as, you know, the earth is round type thing, where it does, as Alex Jones said back in the Sandy Hook days, realizing how the degree to which you have been lied to about almost everything causes you to basically not believe anything, even things which some people take, um, you know, for as granted as the sky is up and the earth is down. Um, before 2020, have you, had you ever been arrested? Had you ever been in trouble with the law? And I'm not asking, and not an asking as an accusation. I just want to pinpoint whether or not. And I'm so glad you brought this up because there's a wonderful meme and there's an ongoing scheme uh, that they've been using against me for three years where there's another gentleman with the same name, Christopher Sakocha. And he's from the same area as me. And only he's four years older than me. So he's the same age as my sister, which would be impossible uh, if it was supposed, if it was me, unless we were twins. And uh, he also has a different birthday than me. This gentleman also has a laundry list of crimes, including heroin, cocaine, gun charges, gang charges. From from Toronto? From Ontario? Yes, from Toronto. A, a Christopher Sakocia in Ontario. How, yes. how, how uncommon a last name is Sakocia? My last name is Fred. Really it's really not that uncommon. There's quite a few Sakochas around. Like okay. if you Google my name, more than one of us will pop up. Uh, there was even another Chris Sakocha at my sister's school where my sisters went. Because my sisters went to a different high school as me. So at their high school, there was a Chris Sakocha, And everybody thought they were related. They were, we weren't even related. So this gentleman's four years older, has a different birthday, has a very lengthy criminal record. But it's obviously not me. He's not married. His father's dead. And if they ever show a picture of him, I guarantee it doesn't look like me. But that doesn't stop people on the internet from pretending it is me and even making a meme that posts my picture alongside these criminal charges. And then I can't use defamation of character on people because they have they can go and use this. They can use the excuse. Well, it's the same name. So I had a reasonable expectation that it was you. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I tell someone, hey, that's not me. It's just another guy with the same name as me. They're not allowed to post that shit anymore. So you know what they do? They'll create a fake profile or they'll just send it to somebody else to post it. So it gets to proliferate. But before 2020, the only trouble I ever had with the law was driving related offenses. I used to I used to drive I used to drive very fast as I, when I was like 19, 20 years old when I was a okay, kid. Okay, like speeding, not DUI. No, no, I never I don't drink. I've never had a DUI in my life. I don't drink at all. That's another thing about me. I don't I, I don't drink any alcohol. Okay, well, I, I now need to get this question out of my mind just for curiosity. Have you been into mixed martial arts? You're obviously quite um, ripped, as they say in the industry now. Were you always like that, or did you get into it later on in life? Uh, I started training when I was like 15. When I was like eight or nine years old, if you saw me in a picture of 10 people, you wouldn't even be able to pick me out because I was fat because I had an Italian mother that would just feed me everything. By the time I was like 12 years old, I was a string bean with a little belly. And then when I was 15, I was like, hey, it's start time to start working out. And so I've been working out uh, 25 years now, uh, religiously. I've been doing different types of martial arts, uh, Thai boxing, even Commando Krav Maga. I'm actually a certified instructor for that. So we know how to do knife disarm, gun disarm, things like that. I, so, I teach women self-defense classes, things like that. The Chris Sicaccia that people said uh, had drug convictions. I mean, if it's, I mean, the internet will figure this out, but it, it's a different Chris Sicaccia and you had not prior to 2020 been arrested on, on anything meaningful. When I was 19 years old, I was arrested for possession of marijuana, about an ounce, and then the and the the, the, the charges were dropped when I paid a two hundred dollar donation. Because that was the only the only charges I've ever had to do with drugs in my life. Okay, so and, now, and, so yeah, so 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 twenty. Like I'm trying to think of anything relevant that I've missed pre twenty pre lockdown. You're in business. You're in real estate development uh, prior to twenty twenty. 
anything material happening until COVID hits? And then, or, or, or you were not a public figure that I know of before. I'm trying to think if I have missed a gap in your life. Tw- not 20- really. Okay, so tw- now we had 20- I, my wife and I had a following on Instagram already because my wife's very attractive, and uh, we would like we like to travel around the world a lot. We've been to over forty countries, so we would post all the places we would travel. We were often That's with right. other gorgeous girls so we had like a 90,000 people following us on Instagram and I did talk about I was always the guy and a guy speaking out again about the government NWO that kind of stuff since I was a lot younger so but I just wasn't very vocal about it I definitely wasn't active in any way like beyond just talking about it online where's your wife from again she's originally from Texas she's a U.S. citizen okay but but she's a Filipino background so apparently I'm racist but I'm married almost 10 years to a Filipino you, you and so many others. It's 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 very directed uh, discrimination, uh, Chris. Um, show if if I make that that shirt says adopt a truck, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm wearing that for my buddy. It's a it's a custom made shirt, adopt a trucker for my friend Chris Guerra. Beautiful. Okay, so now 2020 hits. Uh, the lockdowns come. You have a you have a social media platform already for some reach. Uh, what like what what's your Two weeks to flatten the curve, Chris. I, I was an idiot and I was, you know, I feel like an idiot. And I can tell you something that I never told anybody in an interview. Do it now, please. Ever. And I'm going to clip it. 51 minutes and 12 seconds. Chris, go. Okay, well, the problem, like, just, right when I started speaking out about everything, it was because, sorry. I said, you you, liter- you literally just froze as, as you said, I'm going to tell you something that I've never said before. Sorry, go ahead. Did I unfreeze? Yeah, you're good now. Okay, so everybody knows that I started fighting with COVID in February 27th, 2020, exactly on my wife's birthday, because that was the day we landed in Venice, Italy for Carnival, and it was the day that they actually canceled Carnival for the first time in Italy's history. And it was the day they started the huge propaganda campaign that called Venice the epicenter of the virus. So we spoke about all, I spoke about this many times, so we already started speaking out just from there. From Venice, we ended up in Florence, and we ended up in Netherlands, and we ended up in France, and we finally made it back to Toronto uh, beginning of March, like March 3rd. So right away, we started trying to warn everyone that they were going to lock us down. And I was telling people on Instagram, and we had, like I said, almost 100,000 people at the time. Uh, so I got a call, and I'll you know, tell this person, I'm not going to say who it was. Let's just say it was a person I was very close with that I had known for about 30 years, so since I was an early child. And they basically threatened me that I was pissing off some really rich and powerful, well-connected people with my posts because I had reach and people were listening to me and they wanted me to shut up or else. Uh, and I was like, well, if they're so rich and powerful, why are they getting you to talk to me? Why wouldn't they come talk to me themselves? And before you can answer, I said, because they're not as powerful as they want you to think because they know if they came up and said this to me in my face, I'd probably smash their face and they wouldn't be powerful enough to stop me. I go, so neither are you. And I hung up the phone on this person. About half hour later, I got another phone call from an individual. And let's just say this person was exponentially closer to me. And uh, they basically told me the same thing, that if I don't stop, they're going to do this, they're going to do that, they're going to do this. Basically, everything, including take my money, take my reputation, take my family, and at the end, take my life if I didn't shut up. And like I said, this person was exponentially closer to me than you can possibly imagine. So to not take it serious would have been a detriment. And I did take it serious. I took it to the heart serious. And I told this person that you can go tell your people that not only am I not going to stop speaking out about this, but when you check in with me this time next year, I'm going to be known as one of the leaders of this around the entire world, the movement against you. And that's and so I'm telling you, from the very get-go, when I started speaking out, there was already an anvil hanging over my head, ready to drop. Because these, no. these people have been watching me. And if you see my person of interest profile, which was sent to me by the Globe and Mail, because they had it posted on the uh, the public inquiry website, where, we were, where they had the government investigate themselves, it has the highest rating possible of and that they can give out, that an intelligence agency gives out. And it's over 19 pages long. And a lot of it's redacted. And a lot of things about me are redacted. Because uh, the government can't really explain in public why or how they're doing a lot of the things that they do to me. Even just flying to Toronto, was a uh, they tried to stop me from flying here uh, two days ago. I was using Flair Airlines, 
Flair Airlines is an independent operated airline. However, they receive taxpayer funding from the government. This airline, and this is something else that's never been said on an interview, but I'm going to let everybody know because people need to know this. Uh, Flair Airlines, I've never flown in my life, but I am known. Uh, they don't want me flying because they don't want me traveling. They even took my license away with court conditions to stop me from driving. They don't want me getting around. They don't want me speaking. But I've never flown Flair Airlines, so I figured I was safe. I tried to book a, a flight on their on their webpage, and I actually made a video of this and posted it on Twitter. As soon as my name and birthday gets typed in, you get an error, and it won't let you book the flight. If I even change one character of my name or my birthday, it'll work. So I went on their live chat, and I got an agent to come on. And I know this is all recorded by them, and I could subpoena it for court if I had to. So I asked them straight up why I'm being illegally prevented from purchasing a flight on your on your airline. And they tried to lie and say that I wasn't and that they could book it for me right then and there. And I got it all documented. And then I told them, it's okay, I'm going to book it myself. And I tried again to book it myself just to confirm that I couldn't and I couldn't. So I went to a third party website and I booked it, like an Expedia.com, but not Expedia. Uh, and I booked the flight. So when me and my wife went to the airport yesterday to fly out, the girl behind the counter looks at my ticket, looks at my passport, and I see something. I see her staring at the computer, so I already know something's up. So she calls somebody, and she comes up, and she comes back, and she's like, I'm going to need to see your reservation. I go, well, you have it right there on the computer. She's like, no, I'm going to need to see the confirmation number. So I pull up my email. I show her the confirmation number. She goes, I'm going to need to see the credit card used to book this. No problem. I pull out the credit card I used to book it. She goes, and she gives them the last four digits. The person on the phone says something to her. She goes, Sorry, that's not the credit card you used. I go, well, that's my only credit card, so I know it's the credit card I used. She's like, no, you must have used a different card. Uh, and if we can't verify which card you used, we're not going to be able to honor the reservation because our system is showing that your card is compromised. So I said, and I was videotaping at this point. So I said, and she saw that I was videotaping. So I said, excuse me, are you Visa? How would you know if my credit card is compromised? And she didn't have an answer for that. So I gave her my debit and I said, maybe it was this card just to play uh, devil's advocate. And she tried that card. And they said, no, it wasn't this card either. They go, sorry, sir. Since you can't verify what you used to pay this card, the ticket, we're not going to be able to, uh, uh, we're not going to be able to fulfill your reservation today. You're not going to be flying with us today. I go, okay, I have a better idea. How about, well, I just had you on tape. I'm calling Visa as we speak. I'm going to get them on the phone. I'm going to get them to verify that that was the credit card that booked that ticket. And that there's absolutely nothing wrong with my credit card. And then you're going to have to explain to me and the world why you just lied and why you're trying to prevent me from flying on your airline. Guess what they said? Sir, if you please hang up with Visa, we'll refund you this flight and we'll allow you to rebook the exact same flight for the exact same price. And use the exact same credit card that they just said was compromised. Did you, did you get this part on recording as well? Oh, I did. And the best okay. part was while I was arguing with them, guys walked by and said they're going to vote for me for mayor. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's the rationale behind allowing you to cancel the flight, reimburse, and rebook it on the spot? Because because then they can verify the credit card that was used to purchase the seats. L let me let me back you up a little bit there because you had two stories. The first one of somebody close to you, a friend or you know fr friend friend or family calling you up to say stop doing this, stop posting this stuff. People don't like it. The threats. I, I can't verify any of this, and I, 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 you know, people can take it with whatever skepticism. I recorded or... the phone call between me and the second person, but I won't post it online because I don't want to embarrass that person. Because I went they... off on them like you've never seen me go off on anybody. Well, were they were they imparting this to you as a threat or out of concern that like they're going to ruin your life? And what sort, like tangibly, what were the threats like? It was more threats and concern for themselves. It was threats of being. Uh, being ruined financially, being ruined reputationally, have my family taken from me, be arrested and be killed. Basically, you know, the standard, the standard threats that anybody gets when they go against the establishment. Only they, they got somebody, let's just say they got somebody I didn't expect to reach out to me. And were they reaching out to, to, to reiterate the threat as though they would carry it out? Or this is what someone's told me and I believe them type threat? It sounded like a bit of both, <laughs> to be honest. Okay, oh. very very interesting. I'm I'm not pushing it, Chris. When you release that to the public, I'm sure it'll be of interest. So, other than a driving issue, uh, you start. What was the first criminal charge that was that was lev levied, leveled, issued against you, uh, post the world shutting down? 
I was the first person to get a quarantine violation ticket. Because I went to, uh, we got invited to go speak in Ireland September 2020, September 2020, and I spoke September 11th in Ireland to like 25,000 people. It was amazing. It was the first time I was ever in Ireland. And uh, I tried to warn them that they were going to get locked down on September 20th when they were supposed to be opening up Ireland on September 20th. And I warned them about the five levels of lockdown that they were going to get, they were, they were going to get, and how they were going to tell them they're in level two and they're going to bring them to level three rather than level one and open them up. And then I tried to warn them that by Christmas, they'd be in level five lockdown and told they can't go more than five kilometers away from their house, which is what the whole plan for the 15 minute city is not more than five kilometers from your house. And that's where this all comes from. It's a prior UN directive. So I spoke there on the 11th on the 20th, everything happened as I said. And when I tried to fly home, guess what happened? I got to the airport at four 30 in the morning. We had a five 30 in the morning flight KLM airline. And they try, I swear to you, this is, it was like something out of a movie. We walk up to the th we walk up to the uh, the, the counter, and my, they give my wife's passport. They scan it. They scan my passport, and right in front of my eyes, the whole computer just crashed, and like went crazy. Like I don't even know. It just crashed and turned off. And they're like, "Oh, that's odd." So they went to the computer next to it, scanned it, and it crashed again. So they go back to the original computer. They go, "It must be something wrong with the scanner." So they put it in manually. And the computer screen just went black. So they didn't know what the hell was going on. So we called the tech support department for KLM. The manager came out and everything. And the manager said he's been working for KLM for 12 years and he's never seen anything like this in his life. Then we, we got to their tech department. Their main tech wasn't going to be in for another 15, 20 minutes. We had to wait. We waited the 20 minutes. The guy calls us, the tech guy. He's like, I've never seen anything like this. There are two electronic blocks placed on this gentleman's passport that are preventing him from being able to register and fly. He's like, we cannot tell you which agencies have put these blocks on your passport, but we can tell you that they're illegal and we're obligated to remove them and allow you to fly. So they removed whatever blocks were on my, on my passport. I got to fly from Ireland back to Toronto. Uh, the next week I was having a big protest in Toronto on the Saturday on the fry. And we were supposed to be on quarantine. So on yeah, the this is, this is after they've, did they ever formally invoke the quarantine act? Or I, I don't. Yes, remember. they did. They did. They did. They did in early 2020. So this was I, now September 2020. The quarantine act was in play. The CDC in August 2020 had already rescinded the 14 day quarantine and had already switched to a 10 day quarantine. So we were already imposing a 14 day quarantine with really no scientific evidence and no scientific support. So it was already ridiculous. And I and I wasn't planning on following it. The Friday, the day before the protest. Police showed up at my house and I have a five and a half acre property with a gate gated and fenced all the way around. So they couldn't come to my front door. They could only come to the front gate and call me. So I get a phone call at the police and there's squad cars outside my front door. So I walk over. I'm like, what's wrong officers? I'm like, Oh, nothing. We just know you're planning on going to the protest more. And we came to warn you not to go and not to violate your quarantine or we're going to arrest you and blah, blah, blah. I go, that's perfect. I was hoping for that. And, not, and I was videotaping them at the time. I go, that's exactly what I want because I want to prove to everybody that this is, uh, you have no teeth with these laws. These laws are fake and you're just trying to scare everybody into compliance. So I'll see you guys tomorrow and I look forward to getting my charges. They're like, well, we wouldn't recommend that. And they left. So the next day we went to the protest, like we said. We parked about two blocks away. They had a group of seven officers, eight officers, cut me off before I could get to the protest and threatened to, to, to arrest me, do this. But we were filming them as well. And in the end, I was like, if you guys aren't going to arrest me, then I have a speech to go make. They didn't do anything. They let me walk by. They didn't put a hand on me. I went and did my speech. And then after the speech, I saw CBC News show up. Now I was like, okay, that's weird because the CBC never shows up, especially at a big protest that makes us look powerful and legitimate. They would show up if nobody was there, maybe. So already I knew something was up. And then sure enough, a cop walks over, taps me on the shoulder, and he apologizes first and then hands me a ticket. And I look at it, it's a quarantine violation ticket. And, and CBC is taking pictures and stuff. And you can, find the, you can find the picture of me on the internet. It's me sitting there with a ticket in my hand, and I'm crouching down to get it from the officer, and I'm smiling. And then right after that, I look at the ticket, and I notice that they put all my information, including my first and last name, spelt wrong on the ticket. So I knew that they knew that this ticket couldn't even go to court. So I went back up on stage, grabbed the mic, and I told everybody what just happened, said I'm the first person to get one of these tickets, and I'm going to prove that it's bullshit. And I said, but I want you guys to come here right now and give me a real ticket with my real name on it so I can actually challenge it in court. They did it. So then the very next week, I came back to the protests 
uh, and I was on day 13 of my quarantine. And this time they didn't bother me at the protest because they didn't want to make fanfare and give me publicity. They just waited till after the protest and then they served my wife and I with the summons and we were the first people to be charged criminally under the quarantine act. So they want to put I, me in jail for that. And I, I can confirm this because I, w- I went back and rewatched uh, a CTV news uh, piece, which I, I sent myself, I wanted to share a clip because it's like watching insanity uh, occur. But at the time, people people like didn't think it was insane. Um, so this is uh, this is this uh, this I know at least CTV reported the same stuff. They they issue a summons for you, and I went back to look my my vlog where I talked about the quarantine act. My goodness, I can't believe how early. Look at this. Look at this, Chris. That's what I used to look like at the beginning of COVID. Uh, ah! was, was March twenty twenty was March twenty fourth, twenty twenty. Uh, I as a lawyer never even knew that we had a quarantine act, and then I read through it, dissected it, broke it down, much to my horror. So. They issue a summons for you uh, for having attended this rally without adhering to the instructions that were given to you under the Quarantine Act, which was isolation, quarantine for 14 days. Even though you're not a vector, you're not a suspected vector, you tested negative, I presume. Um, and then, and so what, 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 what happens after that? Uh, so I've been fighting, I'm still fighting that in court. I have court for that in April. Because they just keep um, postponing it and postponing it and postponing it and trying to make deals. And they try to leverage all the other fake charges they put on me to make deals that I won't like. Like, for instance, if they want me to... They, I, one of my other charges is theft of maple syrup at Longo's. I don't know if you saw on. that video. No, I'm pulling up this one. This one's from the uh, very, very, very thorough, very respectable anti-hate.ca. Uh, is it, this one is about you. Yeah. The, the, well, when, I want to get to the gun charges. Wrong, what the wrong. hell? Anti-Semitic, anti- let me just make sure that we're talking about the right person here. I don't think they're talking about me here. That, I never seen that one oh, about geez, my no, phone. No, no, sorry, sorry. This was. I was like, one. what the heck? That's a, that's that's even new for me. Like, no, Hold no, no. On a second. Let me just make sure because I had. Oh, that's the wrong article. It's definitely uh, the wrong uh, article. Hey, no, no. When, when asked for a statement, this is a, okay. So it's another. This is an anti-mask. It's slapped into the same article. Okay, well, hold on. That wasn't the one I wanted to bring up. Close that down. Um, Okay, sorry. Get to the stealing maple syrup. The the issuing death threats against uh, Doug Ford and other politicians. Okay, well that. Okay, we'll start with that one. That was all linked to a man by the name of Rob Carbone. Everybody uh, that knows me probably know who Rob Carbone was because me and him were together, uh, seen together between September all the way up into probably February or March of that year. And Rob Carbone reached out to me when I was in Ireland, and he had somebody reach out to me and give me a number with a special security code that I would have to put in to contact this guy. So I was like, who is this guy? Sounds serious. And when I started talking to him on the phone, he presented himself as like a basically the Donald Trump of Canada, like a multi-billionaire banker from the States, now living in Canada after spending the last 15 years in California and LA in this mega mansion. He was talking about all these high-tech to- the technologies like Elon Musk. And we talked for like an hour, and he tells me that he wants me to come See him when he got when I get back to Toronto because he wants to help the movement and he's got all this money and all these connections. So I said sure. So I went to Yorkville, which is one of the nicest neighborhoods in all of Toronto, uh, to meet this guy and we had lunch. And then he brings me to his condo to introduce me to his wife, who's in like her sixties and she's not wealthy or anything. So it's like, oh, this guy seems like a really good guy. He's with this woman who's almost twelve years older than him. He's got all this money, nice place. Seems like he wants to help. Then he decide, tells me he wants to start the Republican Party of Canada. And he, he has all this money to do it, and he's gonna and he flies in a web designer that, to actually live in his condo to work every day on building the website. He hires a team of six people to start writing all the stuff he needs to to get it registered. So I fully believed in this guy, and he and he was throwing money around like crazy. Uh, and then after a few months and doing more investigation into him, I found out that this guy was basically a con artist and a fraudster, and even had a criminal record as such. So when it came down to uh, May of 2021, it got to the point where I found a couple of his victims and they all wanted to take legal action against him. And this is actually an evidence document from the court case. Uh, It's me sending him an email on May 18th, 2021, stating unequivocally that I know he's scamming people and I know he owes all these people money and that I have some of his victims with me and that we're going to be coming to his house with the police to have him charged criminally and civilly for fraud. So the very next day on May 19th, he calls 911 and says that I threatened to kill him, Doug Ford, uh, Jason Kenny, and all these people with my guns. And he knew I had guns, and he knows I've been shooting since I was a child. 911 basically laughed at him and hung up on him. 
let, so let he called stop, stop there for one second l l guns all lawfully procured you have a you know the, the pal yeah, yeah I, have a, I have a non-restricted and restricted gun license i'm a member of a local gun club i've shot in the i had to shoot in a competition just to be uh, be able to qualify to shoot on the long range there i'm a very good shot i'm better than uh better than the vast vast majority of people in the world let's just put it that way and they know that so they wanted that he want and he knew they would know that. So they wanted to take it serious. I've never shot a person in my life. I've never intended to shoot a person. I haven't even shot an animal in my life. So for, uh, I just know how to shoot because it was just something I was taught as a child, and I, I had a fascination with firearms. So he knew that he wanted to exploit that. He called them and told them I threatened to kill him and all these other people. They laughed it off. They hung up on him. Then he called back an hour later and lied and said he had a tape recording of me saying all these nasty things. So at this point. They had to take him seriously. They brought him in. He gave a 47-minute police statement. I know this because I saw it in court. And then at the end of the police statement, they ask him for the tape recording. And he gives them an excuse that he can't give it to them because his wife is dying of MLS. That was May 2021. And that was the same excuse he used for not being able to come to court in January 2023. Two years later, he couldn't come to court because his wife was dying. And two years prior, he couldn't give him the evidence, the only evidence against me, because his wife was dying even though it was supposedly on his phone, the phone that he had on him, when he was at the police station to give evidence. Now, anybody else, they would have dropped the case immediately when they don't have any evidence. But in my case, they use it as a way to paint me as an attempted cop killer, an attempted murderer of public officials in the, in the media. They use it as an excuse to take away my license so I couldn't drive for the last two years. They use it as an excuse to take away my gun license and take away all my guns. And they use it as a way to postpone the trial uh, as long as possible so they can use this as leverage on my other cases. For instance, I have a case where they want to charge me for stealing maple syrup at Longo's, and they told me they'll drop that case. I don't oh, get to that. No, I'll no, get no, to that no, in a second. Where, 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 at where? Loblos? Longo's, Longo's, Longo's. It's a very high-end supermarket in Ontario, and I'll tell you the story <laughs> in a few seconds. But they told me that they'll drop the theft of maple syrup charges against me if I allow them to keep all my firearms that they've illegally confiscated and illegally taken for no reason when I have no criminal record, when they know I'm going to get off that other charge. Well, uh, but it, it, uh, above and beyond confiscating your firearms, do you would they also confiscate your, 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 your restricted firearm license? Yeah, they took my pal, of course. They took my firearms license, my driver's license, and they took all my firearms. And they don't want to give them back. And then they try it, and they know they're going to lose these charges in court because it, I finally went to court and I can talk about this now because it's all done. The closing arguments are done. I have to wait till March 28th for the judge to give his final deliberation. But I'm willing to bet my right and left testicle that I'm getting acquitted on their ridiculous charges. So that's why they're trying to use the case as leverage against me for my other cases before it becomes irrelevant. So it's a giant clusterfuck. And I've been charged with over 60 charges in multiple provinces. And so far, I've beaten over 45, 40 charges in Toronto, in Ontario alone. I beat every single one of my charges in Alberta, which I had multiple arrests in multiple cities with over a dozen charges, and they dropped all of them at the same time. That's how politically motivated and targeted everything against me has been. And so I'm a man, I'm, I still have no criminal record. Okay, that's what I was just going to ask. You haven't yet been convicted of any of the charges, the post-COVID charges. I've never been convicted of any charges ever in my life. Um, uh, explain to me how they take your license. Did they can't, they didn't cancel your passport? Oh, okay. So this is what happened. So after Rob told these people, look how shady this is. After Rob told these people that I'm a threat, that I'm going to go kill Doug Ford and all these people and that I have guns, they decided to call two off duty undercover officers from the major crimes unit and tell them to go and stake out my house. Now, I remember my house is five and a half acres and I have it fenced all off and gated all off. So you can't even come towards my house. I also have 24 hour surveillance cameras with signs as big as me, red and yellow, that say 24 hour surveillance, multiple signs. The police testified in court that they didn't know I had cameras and didn't know about my signs because in court they had to testify that they saw me. They were told to go watch my house. One car, two officers, completely unmarked car impossible to know it's a police vehicle even if you're sitting inside it with completely plain clothes officers wearing black masks and apparently they're staking out my house and i arrive home and this is the same day that i'm supposed to be launching a tour to launch my book 
and go all the way to front to Vancouver that same day. I was supposed to drive to Vancouver, launch my book, and cut and, and start my first cross Canada tour. Your book so is very just, coincidental just, timing. Your book is just say no. That's correct. And okay. it's the first and only book in the history of the world to be granted a publishing deal by Amazon and then banned the day it was supposed to go on sale. They basically gave me the deal, strung me along, made me jump through all the hoops to make sure I couldn't get deals anywhere else. And then they 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 canceled the deal on me the day before it was supposed to go on sale. The day and after I got arrested. I'm sure none of this was planned in advance or coordinated though. And it's it's not yet back on Amazon. Not only is it not on Amazon, I was selling it on my own website. They canceled my PayPal to stop me from being able to sell the book. All right. Now I know the story of the unmarked police car with the un the the plain clothes officers, but explain what happens to them. Okay, so they tried the, 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 what really happened was this, they tell everybody that they were given orders that they couldn't arrest me unless I left the premises, which makes absolutely no sense. If I had an arrestable warrant, it makes much more sense to arrest me at my residence before, so I can't drive into someone, I can't cause a danger to the public. That's the safest place possible for them to uh, arrest somebody. You're not going to wait for that person to get in their car and start driving somewhere. That's a danger to the officers, a danger to me, and a danger to the public. It's absolutely ridiculous. The only reason, practically, that they waited for me to leave my house is because they wanted to do something illegal, and they knew they were going to be on camera. So they waited for me to leave my house after testifying in court that they were told they could only arrest me if I left my house. And then, after I left my house, they were told to initiate an unsafe, aggressive takedown with only one vehicle and two officers, unmarked and undercover, when they're never supposed to do that. They're always supposed to have at least two vehicles and multiple officers. So they already are not going by protocol at all. They already got two guys that were off duty, called into work for no reason to go stake out my house. They already bred, they already uh, missed protocol for not arresting me at my house. And then they wait for me to drive. And as I'm driving down the road, I'm driving down Keel, I make a right onto King Road. As I'm making a right onto King Road, I see a silver sedan starting to overtake me on the left side. And I only notice because I see two adult males wearing black masks in the car. And I'm like, look at these idiots wearing masks in their car. Mask wearer driving, idiots. Before I could think, that car pulls right in front of me, slams on the brakes to the point where if I didn't slam my brakes, I would have rear-ended them. So now I'm stopped in the middle of the road, and this unmarked car is in front of me. And a guy jumps out of the passenger and driver at the same time and starts running towards me with plain clothes, black masks, and guns in their hand. When they get about five feet away from me, the guy that got there first was the driver, the guy that had jumped out of the driver's side. He started raising his gun like he's going to shoot me in the face. So I put my truck in reverse. I reversed on an angle to get out of the line of fire and make it easier for me to go around them and their car. And then even by the officer's own testimony in court, I slowly accelerated until I was safely around the officer and then accelerated. But that didn't stop them from charging me with assault with deadly weapon on police officers, saying that I tried to run them over with my car and justifying them not being able to allow me to drive for the last two years. So that's what happened with that. I, I'm trying. Th there's uh, the court cat. I think it's the same Twitter feed that was following a lot of the convoy stuff. Has a Substack with documenting your trial because I'm just trying to look. Every article I see from CBC makes no mention of the officers being plain clothes or not in uniform. The, uh, some of them I think mentioned that the police car was unmarked, but uh, yeah, sure. N nothing. Nothing. Nothing can go wrong. Like you know, when unmarked, un plain clothes officers bust down Brianna Taylor's door and then get fired back by her boyfriend, and it led to what happened there. Um, so from this, it's amazing. So this stems from somebody says, you said you're going to kill Doug Ford and other politicians. And I, I haven't known you very long. I've seen you for the last few years. Call, maybe I'm naive. I don't, I don't believe it for a second. Um, especially given, well, especially given what you're doing, uh, in terms of activism, it's just, it would be irresponsible. Counterproductive to say the least. <laughs> I say irresponsible, yes, counterproductive and outright stupid. I have seen systematically, and we have all seen, how they do this as an MO. And now I'm going to start sounding like Alex Jones. They went after Randy Hillier, and they charged Randy Hillier with assaulting a police officer so they could have the headline. Now, they wouldn't be able to get away with this type of conduct on Randy Hillier, but they get away with the charges, assaulting a police officer. So you, you allegedly threaten to kill not just Doug Ford, 
all I mean, I, what was it? All these politicians. I don't know who they all were. the premiers, all the premiers in Canada, basically like the governors in the United States. Coming from one um, individual, and I don't really care much more about that individual, but coming from one individual who levied the accusations. They and an individual to... who, by the way, has multiple convictions for fraud, theft, and uttering death threats himself. Not charges, convictions. Well, the confession through projection, but let's... Um, so it comes from that accusation. During the context of the arrest, which seems to have been done with an unmarked car with plainclothes officers, they then, CBC, and I'll pull up that article, allege that you tried to run over the police officers and that you're you're basically the biggest menace to Canadian society since menace to society. I don't know who else. Um, okay. You Reality. Have... I was scared. I was scared shitless. I thought these guys were either trying to kill me or kidnap me. I had no idea they were police officers. And what bolsters that argument is when I did get away from them and I was a safe distance and I noticed I wasn't being chased or followed. I called my lawyer and my lawyer called the police to find out what the hell was going on. And when I found out that I had those ridiculous charges on me, guess what? I turned myself in the same day. So why would I run from the police just to turn myself in a few hours later if I knew I, they were police? I Especially me. I think it's been arrested have, 20 times before. Well, I think you might. Uh, but the, the articles I, I read said you turned yourself in the next day, but d details, Lies. Chris. Same day. <laughs> same day, hours um, later. So you just had the trial for, for the threat accusations? Yes, I've had the trial January 4th, 5th, and 6th. Then we had to come back February 15th. Then I have to go back February 28th. And now i got to wait for the the, uh, the judge's decision on March 28th. Is it a decision on the substance or is it a procedural decision? Like you're going to find it's out a complete, acquitted... It's a pre complete verdict. I'm going to okay. get the verdict on the death threats, verdict on the... Uh, uh, assault with deadly weapon on police officer. And the third charge was dangerous operation of motor vehicle. So I'm getting, I have to get off all three of those charges. Wow. March 28th. Okay. Well, I'll be, I'll be following that. Um, Chris. Okay. Let's, let's, um, geez. Uh, I think th we can, there's a number of stories for all of these charges, but no convictions yet. So people can make what they want of the accusations themselves. The power lies in the accusations. No convictions and over 40 charges beaten in Toronto, in Ontario, and a dozen charges beaten in Alberta, and charges levied against me in New Brunswick dropped without even going to court. Let's talk about uh, uh, a video you put up the other day Pierre Poiliev, Anaïda Poiliev. Uh, switch is it called switch health switch health okay i gotta tell everybody about this because everyone's saying oh she wasn't the ceo she's not connected this entire well, company was on, started by conservatives hold on hold on. stop right there let's let's back it up a little bit um no you know what stop that i'll, I'll start from the beginning okay switch health for those who don't know what, what it is and let me pull up the website while you do this switch health was the number one provider for covid test kits for air travel they would get these COVID test kits for pennies, for dozens of them, and sell them to you for hundreds of dollars, making insane amounts of profit. Switch Health was started in 2018. Switch Health has people from the conservative government, including people like Jordan Paquette, who worked specifically for the public Ministry of Public Health and specifically for the office of Stephen Harper, is the main, uh, main public relations man for this. That other lady, what is her name? Ambrose, Rose Ambrose. She's a, she was a, also a conservative member. There's all these conservative government members who are now members of a so-called private company. This private company is set up right before COVID and starts taking shipments of COVID test kits, which, by the way, if you look at the plane, it's coming from Ukraine. Ukraine sending Switch Health COVID test kits pre-pandemic. And now this private company littered with conservatives throughout it is now getting government contracts for hundreds of millions of dollars that is literally the definition of conflict of interest and if it gets it doesn't get even worse than that Callan Rovanescu who is a multi-gazillionaire CEO and president of Air Canada was the main funder for Switch Health meanwhile they want you to believe that these two 20-year-old students were the CEOs of Switch Health. And cool. they got all this money, hundreds of millions of dollars from Callan Robinescu, who also got, Callan owns Air Canada, which gets hundreds of millions of our tax dollars. So now he uses those tax dollars that he got from our government to invest in Switch Health. He retires as president of CEO of Air Canada and becomes the major senior strategic advisor and major shareholder of Switch Health. And now this man 
who's receiving hundreds of millions of dollars of our tax dollars, is partnering with members of the conservative government in a shady operation created before COVID, and they're making hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars off government contracts that were funded with our tax dollars indirectly. What's the guy? Uh, I'm going I'm to get to one thing in a second. Paquette, what was his first name again? Jordan Paquette. Yeah. P-A-Q-U-E-T. Check out his LinkedIn. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring it up and just make sure that I'm not actually logged into my LinkedIn. Um, hold on. Bring up his LinkedIn. You'll see him as the main public relations guy for Switch Health. Then you'll see him as a friggin' working for the Office of Public Health. Then you'll see him working for the Office of the Prime Minister. He couldn't be more connected to the Conservative Party. Yeah. So there's certain things that I, because I saw your video, I try to do my independent verification. Some things, get this out of here. Some things uh, I can verify or, or, or check out. By the way, small world. Kalen Romanescu used to work at Steichman Elliott with my dad. My dad was there for 43 years. Kalen went on to be uh, CEO of Air Canada. I don't mind private individuals doing what they do. It's business and it's business. Where I, and I'm now once bitten, twice shy by having confounded uh, Paul Rouleau, you know, the commissioner Rouleau with that Pierre Rouleau who was married to Justin Trudeau's aunt. Names like Paquette, um, Rouleau. I'm nervous in terms of making the same mistake twice. This is Jordan Paquette's LinkedIn. Uh, yada, yada, yada. Um, let me see where it was here. Chief of Staff, Government's Office. I mean, this, this is in as much as you can verify this. Vice President, Switch Help. Okay. There you go. Now um, go down. You'll see him at Public Health. Uh, let me see. Oh, the, well, let, let's go to the, what is it? World. Let's go to the World Economic. Here it is. Okay. And, he, and, it, and it says that he worked for the conservative office of the prime minister, strategically partnering with the World Economic Forum. No, what? Does it get any better than that? Well, I'll tell you this. I'll back it. I'll back you up. Maybe back you up. Back you down a little bit, only because 2012, the world's understanding of the WEF is radically different than 2023. The world's understanding of the WEF. I think all of this incestuous relationship looks terrible. Let me get that out of here. Um, is that they, is that not the definition of conflict of interest? When it's, government it's, when government are members of a private corporation that was started with government funding and now gets hundreds of million dollars in government contracts. So literally, oh, I, the conservatives were making money off COVID test kits. That's the bottom line. Why are the conservatives making money off COVID test kits while the liberals are making money off the vaccines? Because we know that Trudeau had shares in Aquitus Pharmaceuticals that, uh, that patented the lipid nanoparticle that is making them billions of dollars. That's so you have the liberals colluding to make money off the vaccines, and you have the conservatives colluding with conflict of interest to make money off the test kits. Here's where I'm just, I, I won't say more cautious than you, maybe more neurotic. I haven't been able to independently confirm that Justin Trudeau or family or extended friends relationship with the I've heard it. I have no difficulty believing it, but I just haven't been able to independently, to my own satisfaction, confirm that to repeat it. Uh, with, with, with Paquette, yeah, it looks like you have someone who's had his hand in government, getting involved in private enterprise, and the opportunity arises. And it's, it's no less insidious than liberal corruption, to the extent that it's true, full stop. Um, Kalen Robinescu, I don't mind private people, private actors doing the, the, Kalen has never been a, a political, um, a, uh, individual, not let me rephrase. He's not been a pol a politician is the word I'm looking for. Uh, but then where I get in, where I, you know, where you want to make sure that you don't lose your, your own credibility or make a mistake that true in substance, but wrong on a detail that people hang their head on. And I eat I was trying to go through the corporate registry and, you know, I have somebody who can pull them up in, in Ontario. Couldn't find that she was ever a shareholder of, of, of Switch Health in particular, a director, sorry, CEO or whatever. But there's a lot of companies that have a similar name and, and you, you don't really know. So where, I, where I'm reluctant is something looks like it smells fishy here. And instead of going full hog and then maybe saying things that are going to be easily disproven, which would then allow someone to conceal the stuff that which might have been true, I would go slower. You're going full steam ahead. Um, but I have. I'm trying to just make the point. I'm trying to make the point across to everybody that it's indisputable that conservatives received government funding and they did it before the pandemic to put themselves in a position to profit off testing people for COVID. That is indisputable by the evidence. Indisputable that they used our tax dollars. Indisputable that they have conflict of interest. Indisputable that they receive hundreds of millions in government contracts. And it's indisputable that this company and the ability to facilitate these test kits was all done before COVID. There, there is the, someone's going to look at you saying that and say, 
you're saying that COVID was set up and deliberately released, pre-planned. Others are just going to say uh, they they knew they had been planning for something of this type of. They had the H1N1 a little while ago. It's just a variant, or it's just you know something along the same lines that they were setting it up so that when and if they could then weaponize it. And I'm saying like between weaponizing a crisis versus manufacturing the crisis, there's a distinction there. Yes. But maybe a distinction without much of a difference when it comes to the end of the day. It's well, the, the government. distinction doesn't matter when you go to the fact that one way or the other, they set themselves up to use our tax dollars to obtain government contracts to make hundreds of millions of dollars off testing people for COVID. Whether they just happen to be right and they and they plan and they guessed right and they planned years in advance for it, or they did it in a sinister way and they had it planned in advance, is irrelevant. Our government should not be in the business of making money off of and exploiting public health emergencies for massive profits. Oh, massive profits. There's also uh, some concern of having harvested DNA through the mail out tests and three companies containing the, you know, retaining the DNA of citizens. Oh, they, they wouldn't do. And people are going to say that's crazy conspiracy theory. The Canadian government <laughs> wouldn't do that when when we now know definitively the Canadian government was using the military to test propaganda techniques on Canadians. And then we have a leak from the British guy talking about how they're going to, you know, release, release the, the variant, strain, release the variant for full compliance. Uh, we know the Trudeau government was doing that. We know the Trudeau government was surveilling us through uh, tr devices, through using cellular data tracking devices. We know, we we know everything that anyone would ever have said is beyond the the, the pale for conspiracy theory is true. Uh, yeah, sending out your DNA with a little swab, uh, Lord knows what was done with it. Um, and and uh, in substance, I mean, look, it's obvious. There's corruption. The government has been making money off of this, left and right. I think the. MPs got their fourth pay raise in the content, you know, since the pandemic, and it's good for them. Um, I yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm neurotic about like taking a paquette, which is a common name, and then saying, oh, wrong paquette, and now Viva, you, you made the rouleau mistake again. But uh, do we do I want to get into the mayorship run, or do I want to first talk about the first video I saw of you, Chris? This is the first one. Was when you were saying you cannot be compelled to submit to a, uh, a PCR test. When you get off, just say no, just walk out, nothing's going to happen to you. At first, being a lawyer and also not wanting to give people advice that can get them arrested, I, 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 never, I never would have said it, never would do it, period. But I looked it up. And in the Quarantine Act, when I was first discovering it, it said you can be compelled to submit to a test, but not one that enters the person, which right. that test did. And uh, that was my first exposure to you that I can recall. Um just out of curiosity, like where'd you even get the information to take that position in the first place? Well, I already knew it was a violation of our rights. So I knew that it, there had to be a chink in the armor in the quarantine act. So I did the unthinkable. I read the quarantine act. <laughs> and so I looked at that point and I saw exactly what you said. They could subject you to a test. Like they could ask you to take your temperature with the gun because it doesn't touch you. They can see if you're sweating. They could ask you if you've been coughing or sneezing. They can give you a, a, they can analyze you that way, but they can't force something into your body, especially something up your nose. So that's just ridiculous. And that's what I told people. And then, uh, and if they can't do that, they obviously can't confine you to a quarantine hotel and make you pay for it. So I told people that. And in fact, I was so confident about that when a friend of mine and his father had arrived from Jamaica and were forced into the quarantine hotel, I made them call me on an Instagram live. I called them an Uber to the quarantine hotel and I had them walk out on Instagram live past the security. I told them what to say to the security word for word. The security just moved out of their way, let them walk out of there. They got in their Uber and they escaped the quarantine hotel, period. It's that simple. And that's all. That's what I try to tell everybody to do. All you got to do is stand up for yourself, no matter what. Doing the right thing is not always the easy thing, but doing the right thing is still always the right thing. All right, now here's the, this is going to be the principled question. I'm going to get to your run for mayor. Uh, what what is the word you use? Mass noncompliance. I forget the term. United noncompliance. United noncompliance. Th this is where I'm not a coward uh, in the sense that there's things that I would do for myself and do on my own that I would not tell other people to do, recommend other people to do, or shame other people for not doing. The you you have a certain liberty of uh, united noncompliance. Arrest me, I don't give an f. Other people don't have the same liberty. Maybe they don't have the same courage, but they also have more um, restrictions in terms of the liberty to do that. Arrest me, give me a ticket, ruin my life. Uh, because many people would consider the charges that you're facing in as much that, as they might. Wait, wait, 
if you're united, they can't do those charges against you. All those charges are on me because I people weren't uniting with me. It was because they were able to go at me alone. So yeah, I'm taking but, those hits over and over and over again for people to let you know that, look, if I can get arrested 25 times and I'm still out here, you can afford to get arrested that one time, maybe, if you're standing up with a whole bunch of other people. So if I can walk the walk and do it, and I can get arrested 25 times, do I feel bad asking men who are supposed to be the protectors and providers of society to stand up for their friends, their family, their loved ones, and their country, and maybe have to take a fine? or maybe end up spending a night in jail. I don't feel bad asking men to do that because I've sacrificed a lot more than that. And in fact, when I was in prison, not even in jail, and this is after I made bail, and instead of giving me the bail that the judge had granted me and I had paid for, they crumpled up the bail paper, threw it in my face, threw me in the black of a back van, a black van, and brought me to the prison and threw me in prison for an extra three days in solitary confinement for fun. Well, the guard came up to me and he said, do you think it's worth it now that you're in here and they can do whatever they want to you? And you know what I said to him? I said, me giving up my freedom temporarily to preserve everybody else's freedom permanently is a good trade for me. And guess what? He shut the fuck up real quick. I'm clipping that portion right there, Chris. <laughs> I just got a timestamp 135 people. Um, hold on. I, I had a thought. Oh, no, sorry. Two things I would say to that. You know, like, it, it's the mutiny on the ship and it's the the, the captain holding a, a one gun with six bullets and there's 100 people. And he says, he's only got six bullets. You know, he, he, they can only shoot six of us. It's like, yeah, well, who's going to be the first six to go forward? Which I guess gets to the, except it's a proverbial gun, not a physical one. But there's there, there's that to it. And then I forgot the second part of it. Uh, United Noncompliance, uh, standing up. I'm going to forget it. Ah, cripe. It'll come back in a second. Um, currently, are you able to leave the country? 100%. I've been leaving the country like crazy. I just get problems flying on specific Canadian airlines. Air Canada, I can't fly on at all because they do the same trick as Flair. It won't allow me to book if I try to book online, even though I'm technically not banned. And also, Air Canada doesn't allow third-party booking. So the only place you can book an Air Canada flight is an Air Canada website, which bans me specifically from booking. Uh, I believe I'm still banned on WestJet and other things, but that's neither here nor there. The thing you got to let everybody know about United Noncompliance, and this is important, is that it, it comes in three phases. Phase one was the global awakening, 2020, when we got everybody to realize that this has nothing to do with your health and safety. This is about power and control. That is the fundamental awakening. When people realize government's not their friend, government's their enemy. Government's not to be complied with, it's to be questioned, period. When people can upset that, all of a sudden, all the propaganda that's supposed to make them afraid, all the propaganda that's supposed to confuse them and make them compliant, it has the opposite effect. It makes them angry and it makes them want to speak up. That's phase one. Now, at this point, the government knows how to deal with people that just wake up. Because in order for you to be effective, you can't just be awake. You have to be awake and you have to be positive. Because if you're awake and you're negative, if you're aware of what's going on, but you're like, oh, my God, we're never going to be able to stop these guys. You're not going to do anything about it. So they try to keep you in a negative state of mind. Because if you're in a negative state of mind, it deactivates your individual power and it prevents you from uniting with other people who have activated their power. So they try to overwhelm you. They try to make you feel hopeless, despair. That's why the news is so bad. And if you can just get around that and feel positive and be positive, now you've activated your power, number one. And now you can connect with other like-minded individuals and amplify your activated power. And that's exactly what they don't want. That brings you to phase two of United Noncompliance. Now we got enough activated and connected people. So phase two is taking action. And we took action all over the world, speaking. Uh, uh, we had rallies. We had documentaries. We had songs, music videos, lawsuits. You name it, we did it. We took action in every way possible to bring awareness, to inspire people, to educate people, and to friggin' put the hurt on these people just like they're trying to do to us. Now we're in this phase, we're in between phase two and phase three. And phase three is holding these people accountable because that's where we get the real lasting change and we can prevent this kind of thing from happening again. The problem is once we were going from phase two to phase three of COVID, they started bombarding us with all the climate change stuff to number one, prevent us from going into phase three and holding them accountable because they don't want to be held accountable. And number two, 
to try to get as many people back into that negative state of mind where they feel overwhelmed and like there's nothing they can do because so much is happening at once. So it's a two-pronged psychological attack that they're doing to us. And the way to get around it is to, number one, simply ignore all the negativity and embrace positivity. And the way to do that is to live your life the way you want. No matter what they say, no matter what restrictions or mandates or what they try to tell you, you do you. You do what makes you happy. And you doing that and you defying them is going to give you a sense of purpose. And it's going to give you a sense of uh it's going to give you a sense of drive to actually want to live life. And that is the secret here. And that's what united noncompliance really means. It's a state of mind that once you achieve it, you are now a weapon and you can combine with other weapons and using the non-aggressive, non-violent doctrine of just say no combined with millions of people, you bring governments to their knees. Wait for some disingenuous hack to to clip out, you become a weapon without saying in a nonviolent manner. I, I'm, I'm, I envision the way the bad people work. Uh, I, Dennis Prager um, uh, says, I don't know if he says it often, but despair is a sin. Uh, and in the biblical sense, and I, it's interesting, I, I, I know the seven deadly sins, sloth, greed, envy. I, forget, I don't think despair, uh, gluttony, I don't, I don't know if despair is one of them, but I, I like the idea that despair is a sin because it's an absolutely useless, self-destructive force. Um, Jimmy Dore said the other day that, you know, like, I, cause I, I'm, I occasionally despair, Chris. Like I, I do wake up and I say like, it's, it's, it's getting worse and it's not getting better. And then I look at my homeland, which is Canada. And the, you know, it's one thing you're talking United non-compliance. I see a lot of people who actually still not only still believe all of this shit three years into it, despite all the lies, they think it was justified. They still think that they're virtuous and, and good for having, what did you say? It was, it was comply. And a cowards, cowardice, and compliance, yes. and like when you when you said it, like it, it, in hindsight, there are eras where people were cowardly and compliant, and where the government said those were good things, and those were totalitarian regimes where coward and compliance of the citizenry is exactly the asset of the government that allows the government to stay in power and commit atrocities. But I just I I, I despair a little bit because I don't see a lot of I still see people clinging to the lie despite all evidence. And then I just try to remind myself of what Jimmy Dore says, which is it's not about waking the sheep, but gathering the lions. Um, all that to say now it leads perfectly into the segue. You're running for mayor of Ottawa. Well, not mayor of yeah. Ottawa, mayor of Toronto. No, Ottawa, sorry. You're running yeah, for but mayor before, of Toronto. Before we even get clip on that, I just want to yeah. expand on what you just said uh, before I forget. And now I almost did forget. You were Compliance talking about... Cowardice. Pardon? Compliance cowardice, just to re remind. Oh, now I forget what I was going to say. It'll come back to me. So we're going to start talking. We'll talk, we'll talk about what led me to want to run for mayor. The idea never even crossed my mind. I wouldn't have thought I had a chance because John Tory incumbent is what people would vote for again and again because people like to do the same things over and over. Uh, but when he resigned, and it happened at the exact time that I was scheduled to come back to Toronto for court and the worldwide rally, it gave me an opportunity if I wanted to, to announce that I'd be running and announce it with thousands and thousands of people there. And I still wouldn't have considered running except that people kept calling my phone and asking me if I was running because apparently I was trending on Twitter and Google as mayor of Toronto. And when I checked, I was. And this is before I even knew John Tory had resigned. And then it hit me. Toronto is the friggin' jugular vein of the World Economic Forum agenda. If we can stop 15-minute cities, carbon taxes, and all that bullshit there, we can stop it everywhere and that's what makes mayor of toronto a very uniquely powerful position more exponentially more powerful than any other mayorship or exponentially more powerful than any other municipal position anywhere in north america and i'll say that and as mayor of toronto i can make changes almost immediately because they were given special powers in 2022 that allows me to veto any bylaws every one of the mandates and restrictions is a bylaw so right away no more mandates and restrictions in Toronto. Right away, everybody who was fired could be rehired. Right away, the police officers that gave out the most COVID fines in the last three years, fired. We don't need those kind of officers. Right away, I would give the police new directives to actually serve and protect the community and foster a new relationship between them. Right away, I would remove the sanctuary city status of Toronto that would give it not 
make it not very favorable for the now 400,000 plus illegals, many of them with criminal records, who are now able to proliferate in the city, obtain city services, and not even be checked out by the police. It's ridiculous. There's so many things in Toronto. There's an almost $17 billion budget that needs to be scrutinized, that needs to be efficiently looked at, where we could be saving hundreds of millions of dollars that could go to special community programs that not only help the minority and other poorer communities, but help the most vulnerable people. We have the largest growing homeless population in the city of Toronto anywhere in the world, outpacing even San Francisco's. And San Francisco is a joke. Meanwhile, where's all, where, where's all this extra money going? We got billions getting wasted while politicians are giving themselves raise after raise, but we don't have any money for community centers or a hospital in a new place or a community housing for some homeless veterans that the, that the country used, abused, and forgot about. There is so much room for improvement in that city. It's been a 30-year slide of the best city in the world to now one of the most expensive, overrated, unsafe, and unhappy cities to live in. I've lived in Toronto for 39 years, and it was better 30 years ago than it was 20 years ago and than it was 10 years ago. So this wasn't something that happened overnight. This was because people just simply didn't care. People sat by and just let the politicians make all their decisions for them. And every year it got worse and worse and worse. So now I'm here to put a stop to that and finally put us on a path of change, a change for the better. And the very first thing I would do after getting rid of those mandates is stop the 15-minute city, stop the personal carbon allowance, stop the digital ID, and not create the need to have a universal basic income because we would create more GDP around the city and we would create a higher standard of living and a lower cost of living around the city so people would be able to look after themselves and not have to worry about begging the government for money every month to survive. That's the city of Toronto that I want to live in, a city where the police are respected. When I was growing up, we all wanted to be police officers. And when we saw police officers, we thought of them as heroes. And we wanted to be just like them. It's not like that anymore. But it should be and it can be. And that will fundamentally not just change Toronto. It will change the mindset in Canada, the United States, and around the world. So when I get elected as mayor of Toronto, it's going to be the biggest tidal wave to wash away this evil bullshit that we have seen thus far. I promise you. Uh, how, how many people vote? in the uh, in the elections in toronto there is 1.9 million eligible voters right now in the last election for john tory less than 29 percent of eligible voters cast their vote that means over 71 percent of people decided they're not going to vote and i'm a non-voter i have never voted in my life and guess what the non-voter is the largest demographic in canada there's more people that don't vote than vote for uh liberals conservatives ndp combined especially in the Toronto municipal election. And I truly believe I can get 50 to 60% of the voters to come out and vote for me. I can think I can get a half a million votes and run away with this election. And when I do, people are going to see Toronto as an example for how a first world futuristic city can still be progressive, still be inclusive, but not diminish the standard and quality of life for everybody living in it. Chris? You have my irrevocable permission to use any portion of this uh, interview as as a as a what, what do they call them as a promotional clip. I'm just reading some of the chat, and everyone's like, "This is." I'm reading the chat in in Rumble, and yeah, people people are liking this. Um, all right, that's amazing. You didn't you didn't remember what it was that you wanted to say before? We were talking about compliance, cowardice, uh, gathering the lions, waking Canadians up who seem to still. Oh yeah, now I remember. I told you it would come back to me. Because you made, you were talking about how you feel despair and how you feel that there's so many people that are still uh, brainwashed, still uh, still going along with this and, and defend getting a fifth shot and wearing their mask, etc. Well, guess what? How many people do you know that say I reject, I regret not taking the vaccine? I don't know anybody, right? But how many people do you know regret taking the vaccine? I know quite a few. Those are all people that no longer trust the government. Those are all people that are more willing to be non-compliant with the government. And now that the fight has changed from a public health emergency to a climate change emergency, we can gather so many more people on our side because now they realize this has nothing to do with public health, nothing to do with safety. This is all about power and control. And they see their lives getting affected. And you can't be called an anti-masker, an anti-vaxxer, 
an uh, anti-public health advocate that's killing grandma and babies. What are they going to tell you? Give up your car for the good of the planet? How many yep. people are going to go along with that? Answer, not as many that went along with COVID. So even if we can get another 10 to 15% of the population on our side, they will never be able to implement this because we already got all the lions. There's already millions of men like you and me that won't go along with this. And now we're inspiring the ones that would have never thought to stand up, never thought to speak out. And they're coming on our side more and more every single day. We're literally in a race right now. And I tell you this all the time. This is them implementing their agenda. And this is us waking up the people to critical mass. And when I can get into mayor of Toronto, I can really slow down this side. And I can really accelerate this side to the point where I truly believe I can tip the scales, not just here, but around the world. When they say one man can't change the world, it's always one man that changes the world. But I can't do it alone. I'm going to need the help of everybody. And I'm going to have it because now more than ever, people are more united than ever before. Not just in the freedom movement, but everything. If I knew all I had to do was to, uh, to unite everybody and get them to discard their differences was to run for mayor officially, to be a representative of the people officially, which I believe I've been unofficially for the last three years, well, I would have done it. And mark my words, even the people that hate me, the people that despise the way I look, sound, hate how I hate the things I say, hate my ideology. You ask those people, how do you like the idea of Chris Sky fighting for you? All of a sudden, their attitude changes quite quick when they see me as an ally and someone that will be standing up for their interests. Because even though they might not like me, they know I'm honest. They know I have integrity. They know I'll still look out for their best interests, even if I don't like them. And that's the difference between me and these politicians. I also have the 20 plus years of development experience that none of these people have. I also have the fact that for me, this isn't a career move. I already have a career, a much better career. This is a sacrifice for me and my family. My wife cried when I told her that I'm going to have to do this because she knows it's another responsibility. She knows it's more negativity coming our way. For all these other people running, they seeing it as an opportunity. They're seeing it as a promotion a pay raise, a career move, that's not for me. And there's nobody like me that will actually fight 24 hours a day. We're going to be living, I'm going to be living with my entire campaign team in the same place from at the end of March to this election because we're going to be working 24 hours a day on the street, seven days a week, talking to the communities and seeing how we can help each individual's needs because everybody's different. You're not going to get an answer from me like you do from the politicians, some fake scripted catch-all answer. You know what you're going to get from me? You're going to get me asking you questions on how to help you individually because everybody needs something different. And that's the difference. I can actually relate to the people. I actually care about the people and I'll get things done. My number is 416- 4009994 and I guarantee you I'm going to be the only candidate that has that number public and I'm going to be the only candidate that's reachable virtually 24 hours a day I'm going to be the only candidate that's actually transparent and actually fighting for the people and the government's scared because they know that I'm already going after the government as a private citizen what do you think I'm going to do when I'm in the mayorship you think I'm just going to let them slide that's where holding them accountable is going to come in 10 times harder you're going to see a fury of resignations in my administration because those resignations are going to preclude criminal charges. And I promise you that I will have the most fiscally responsible mayoral administration in the history of Toronto. I will save the people more money than any other administration over my term. I will raise the quality of life and standard of living. And I will sweep, sweep the table where for the last 30 plus years, every year the government's been doing less with more while asking the people to do more with less. This time it's going to go the other way. The government's going to learn to do more with less. So the people are going to be able to do more in general. Thank you. Now, Chris, where can people uh, follow you for the campaign and when, what is the, uh, when's the vote? Like The vote's June 26th. I become eligible as a candidate. After April 4th, I'm hosting a really upscale dinner. I came to Toronto to get the venue. I'm in Toronto right now, actually. I'm going to launch the name of the venue by tonight or tomorrow. Tickets are going to be available uh, for purchase. It's a mayoral nomination banquet. It's at a really upscale, prestigious, historical venue in Toronto. I'm super excited. That's happening April 1st. Details are going to be released. People can find me on Twitter uh, at Chris Sakocha one 
I know that's hard to spell if you can put it up there because if they try to search me on yeah. Twitter at Chris Sky, I won't come up because I'm banned. I, I noticed that as well, Chris. Hold on. Let, let me. Well, I, I'm going to put all the links in the um, in the pinned comment on both Rumble and YouTube. So set, you'll set. Well, we're going to talk after the stream, anyhow. I'll put I'll put your. Um, I'm just let me let me do it now just to show everybody. But Chris, you don't you don't come up very easily. Here it is. I told you. Chris and then we have a, we have an e we have an email that people can use to either contact me or they can send uh, they can send support and donations of e transfer if they're from Canada, and that email is Chris Sky for Change at mail dot com. Chris Sky F O R Change at mail dot com. That's my it's Twitter, my main. I just got it back, thank God, a couple of weeks ago. So now we have a voice again. My Instagram keeps getting deleted, but it's at Chris Sky eighty three. Guys, I'm gonna have to get going. I just yeah, no, no, Chris, I, I don't. I, I kept you for 25 minutes longer than I said. I, that, then you promised. Um, I'll get up all those links, Chris. Send them to me. I'll put them on the pinned comment in Rumble and um, and YouTube. Thank you for this interview. And everyone has uh, sitting down for a two hour uh, unedited. No, I mean, you didn't ask for questions. You didn't ask for anything. Long format interviews. You get to know someone. And if people have listened to you now and they still harbor whatever beliefs they had or they have new beliefs, that'll be it. But you'll never see uh, any politician that I know of, except for Maxime Bernier, but that'll be a separate, you know, another time, who will sit down for a long term, a long format interview. Chris, thank you. Uh, stick around. We'll say our proper goodbyes. Everyone in the chat got another one tonight, so I'll see you all at seven. But Chris, stick around. We'll just say our proper goodbyes for two minutes, and I'll put in all your links. Thank you so much for doing this. And uh, thank you, brother. Else,